Um, thanks a lot, Emerson, for the for the quirky introduction. I think some of those CAT conflict mediation skills have helped me a lot in my faculty career in mediating faculty meetings, hiring committee meetings, all of the other disagreements that we probably have. Um, so this is actually my second um, splash. The first one was actually 10 years ago, all the way back in 2006 in Portland. Um, so it's been really interesting actually to come to come to this with the 10-year gap and see how this community has evolved, see how it's been transformed over the past years. Um, and it's actually been a great week here just talking to so many of you, um, learning about the different perspectives that you have on programming languages, software engineering, all of the intersections between the two. And it's actually those perspectives that I want to talk about today. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about how those perspectives shape the research um, that we do in this community. Um, and in some ways shape the research that we don't do as well. And I want to try to convince you that there are actually a lot of interesting questions that we don't ask because of the perspectives that sort of dominate um, a lot of the research that happens in our community. So th that's my goal, is to make you think, make you wonder about what else we might ask about and what else we might investigate in the future. So I want to start on a somewhat somber note. Um, three years ago, we lost Seymour Papert. Um, and for some of those that might not know who Seymour Papert was, he was a pretty transformative person in the field of computing in general across lots of different areas. He did a lot of incredible things. One of them was really just starting with this really big idea of computers as thinking tools. Um, this was something that many people were thinking about in the 50s and 60s that kind of transformed one way of viewing what computing is. Rather than something that automates um, everything, it's actually something that augments human cognition and behavior. Uh, similar ideas that Doug Engelbart talked about. This led to this big idea in learning sciences, which was really about constructionism, the idea that people learn and acquire knowledge by, by building it and constructing it through experience and through um, interactions with things. Uh, he was at the foundation of, of um, neural networks and AI with Marvin Minsky and led a lot of the work in the One Laptop Per Child program. So a lot of these things in research and impact were, were very influential. But it wasn't just ideas that he disseminated through some of these perspectives. It was actually people as well, very impactful people that, that um, he helped shape. And so take, for example, Alan Kay, right? Uh, Dynabook, OOP, GUIs, small talk. It's hard to, to look at his career and say that um, this was, these were any small contributions. And, and uh, Papert was behind a lot of these ideas that, that Alan developed over time. Terry Winograd, who helped uh, found Google and the D School at Stanford and, and is a big person in human computer interaction research. Um, also uh, advised by, by Papert, and Mitch Resnick, who uh, launched um, Scratch and before that Lego Mindstorms, which have been huge parts of computing education in, in practice. All of these people were sort of um, greatly influenced by Papert's ideas. And so we have to sort of step back from some of those ideas and ask, where did all of that impact come from? What were the sort of underlying fundamental perspectives that Papert had that, that allowed him to not only create all of these interesting perspectives, but also impact people in that powerful way. Um, and he actually wrote about this um, back in the early 90s. There was a 1991 paper where he talked about something called epistemological pluralism. So if you deconstruct what these two words mean, it basically means appreciating and, and valuing multiple different ways of knowing. Um, it's a really basic idea. Uh, he wrote this with, with Sherry Turkle. And his claim really boils down to something um, as follows. Um, when he looked at computing, and he looked at sort of the dominant viewpoint, uh, which is sort of the formal mathematical view of what computer science is, he said, this is a really powerful thing. It's obviously a generative, productive idea, but it's really not enough. It's not enough to really cover the span of discoveries that we might make. Um, it's not sufficient. And so here's, here's what he said in the paper. Um, he actually tied this to sort of access and equity in computing, too. He said, equal access to even the most basic elements of computation requires an epistemological pluralism, accepting the validity of multiple ways of knowing and thinking about what computing is. Um, so what he meant by that was that how we think about what we know in computer science actually influences not only what we know, but um, who it is that we actually engage in doing computing and computer science and computer science research, because those values that are embedded in those ways of knowing are what attract us to the communities that we're in. Right? You're here at, at Uppsala and Splash and probably other similar conferences because of the ways of knowing around formalism and logic that you use to make discoveries. Right? That was his essential claim. So if you follow that, 
um, and we want to, and we decide we want to involve more people in computing, that means we have to involve more perspectives in computing. So then you have to ask, well, what are these other perspectives that we're not involving, right? Um, on the left, you have sort of a dominant view of computing, and it's still the dominant one, and this computing is essentially uh, math and logic and formalism. And on the right, you have Papert's view that computing is a thinking tool. Um, this is another one that kind of led to the field of, of HCI. What are the other n minus two perspectives on what computing is, right? What are the ones that we're not exploring? What are the ones that we're not answering questions about? Um, I'm not going to tackle all of computing in this talk. I think that's a little bit too big for one, one keynote, even though it's a keynote. I'm just going to go down to the scope of programming languages because I think that's the interesting topic um, of this community. And I want to try to support um, the following claims about, about uh, programming languages and perspectives. One, I want to try to convince you that there are lots of ways, multiple ways, to view what programming languages are from a definitional perspective. Um, and then second, I want to argue that these views really have a vast potential for discovery and research that we haven't really tapped into yet. Um, and that if we do that, we'll um, start to engage more people in computing in the process. So I'm going to do what Papert would do in my approach to this. I'm actually going to take a very human perspective on this and try to mine my own experiences for all of these alternative perspectives on what programming languages are. And then I'll just explore some of the opportunities for um, exploiting them for research um, and research agendas, and then try to tie that back to, to equity at the end. Okay, so let's jump right in. I'm gonna go into life experiences. This is a, a story about the first line of code that I ever saw and what it meant to me and, and how that related to programming languages. So here is uh, my middle school. This was back in 1992. I was about 12 years old, and um, this was when I encountered the first program that I ever saw. At the time, I was a pretty typical adolescent. I kind of had no status. I was not popular. I had no identity, um, really no control over my social experiences. You probably all have had very similar experiences um, when you were 12 years old, right? So that's, that's the frame of mind that you have to remember for that time of all of our lives. My only passion was video games. That's probably also a similar thing for many of the people in the room. Um, and I encountered my first program, not in the context of games, but actually in my pre-algebra class. Uh, my math teacher had us all purchase a TI-82 graphing calculator. R raise your hand if you had one of these, um, right? So look around the room. It's a pretty substantial proportion of the room that encountered this object in their life. So I'm gonna tell you a story about it and see you know, what was that common experience around it. Um, my teacher showed us very little about how to program this thing other than just copy this little program in and you can compute some trigonometric functions that help you do some shortcuts on some math exams. That, ad, that was not interesting to me or anybody else at all, right? Uh, the idea that we could do something about two seconds faster instead of just typing it in, not a big win for us. What was a big win was one of my classmates had an older brother who brought this, his calculator into class and showed us this. Right? This is almost a perfect replica of Tetris, which at the time was a really popular game on the Nintendo Game Boy, one of my favorite games to play on the Game Boy. So suddenly I had this vision of math class where I didn't have to wait through boring pre-algebra trig kinds of stuff. I could actually play Tetris instead of listening to lecture. Um, that vision of math was the one that I wanted to exploit. That, that created this immense motivation for me to understand what is going on behind this game of Tetris. So, so I cut out the mail order catalog uh, link cable thing, waited a month for the cable to show up since uh, you couldn't just click a button on Amazon to get it um, at the time. And once it showed up, got the program, got it transferred in to my calculator, uh, launched the program and was extremely devastated when I could watch each of the pieces fall and e be erased pixel by pixel on the plot and then be rendered pixel by pixel on the line below. It was functionally correct, but <laughs> all of the non-functional attributes of this program were not, uh, not meeting requirements, right? You could not play this game in, at interactive speeds. So um, uh, that was the, my motivation for pressing the F5 key on this and editing this program for the first time and looking at its code and starting to learn this um, language of TI basic. So what I did was um, I realized that like all of this stuff that I was seeing, all of this gibberish behind all of the, the pixels on the screen somehow operated the rules of this game. I knew what the rules of the game were. I just had to figure out what the mapping was between the two. So I pulled out the, 
the Texas Instruments Manual for the calculator and spent about a month reading all of the semantics, the operational semantics of each of these commands in this language um, and ultimately figured out enough about how it worked to kind of rip out the, the um, graphing plot based rendering um, approach that the game used and instead rendered in a text console which was much, much faster and higher performance. So all you had to do was rotate the calculator then you had a nice big trough for all of the Tetris pieces to fall and you could play it at really, really fast speeds. Um, all the other logic was the same. So I just had to replace the rendering engine. So like three months later, you know, I had this new version of the game. I passed the link cable around. Everybody in class was playing Tetris instead of paying attention to class. My goal was achieved. Uh, <laughs> and then I got detention for disturbing all of the, all of the students' learning. And, and had to pull back from that a little bit. But that was, that was my experience, right? So what was a programming language to me in that setting? It was not a formalism, right? What it was was power. <laughs> That's what it was to me. That was the human perspective. Um, it was a way for me to exert control over my classroom, over what I was doing in the classroom, what my peers were doing in the classroom, even what my teacher was doing in the classroom, right? It was a way that I could harness that social setting and make it into something that I wanted it to be. That's what it meant to me. So in some ways, programming languages was just a form of power in that time of my life. Um, now, let's take this metaphor of power to its logical conclusion. If programming languages are power, and with great power comes great responsibility, what responsibilities does knowing a programming language entail? What is that power, and what are you obligated to do because you have it? All of you in this room have it. What are your responsibilities? Uh, for example, why aren't software developers in most countries responsible for the defects and failures that they cause? Is, is that an ethically sound principle that we should operate with? Um, if power corrupts, how does PL corrupt people? Right? That's an important question, too. Mark Zogerberg here um, talking to Cory Booker in New Jersey. Uh, Mark spent uh, $100 million trying to improve New, New Jersey public schools. Why did he think that he could do that without any expertise about education, learning? He had no people on his committee with any expertise in that field. He thought all the only expertise he needed was understanding computing. Um, that's a form of corruption, potentially, right, that you might have to consider. Um, if power is something that democracies distribute, right, should democracies be distributing the power of programming languages? Right? We have to strongly consider whether or not that's the right thing to do with that power. So that was my mindset around what programming languages were from the age of 12 to 13 and so on. Um, and that shifted in the next phase of my encounters with computing. Um, just a quick warning, I'm going to show you a highly unflattering photo of me as a 13-year-old, so get, get prepared. Here I am in my playground. Uh, my brother's over my shoulder, watching me do stuff with my PC. Um, look at that horrible posture. Um, now you're all sort of standing up straight in your seats now, right? Um, so as I was finishing middle school, I primarily used my coding skills to create. And I made things like this. I was interested in 3D rendering and text adventures and other two-dimensional games that I wanted to replicate that I enjoyed on my platforms. So I created all of this stuff and I created it for myself. I didn't give it to anybody. It was just something I made for, for me. It was sort of a, a form of expression. I was using uh, Quick Basic to do a lot of this stuff. I was still using my, my calculator to make things. But it was in no case was the language the subject of interest to me. Right? That was not the intrinsic interesting thing. Um, what it was was that PL was a, me a medium, right? It was an expression. Uh, for me. It was a way to sort of convey ideas that I had and create things that I wanted to share with myself and with other people and, and express ideas that I had in my head. Um, not, again, a formalism, not, not logic. And so if we take this metaphor and we take, for example, uh, Marshall McLuhan's teaching on the medium is the message. M media shapes what messages we ha say and how we say them and we sort of warp and bias our ideas. How um, does PL shape and bias the computation that we do? Uh, what messages do programming languages allow us to convey? Um, and what messages do they allow us to not convey? If that metaphor is sound, right, there's implications here for what programming languages um, do and don't let us uh, express. Um, this is uh, Mitch Resnick, I mentioned him before. He takes a strong view that, that Computing is really just another medium, and it's, a, it's a, all about expression. He thinks really deeply about how programming languages facilitate expression, 
with ideas like um, high ceilings. A programming language should allow you to express many, many things um, and not limit what you can say. But also low floors, where um, if you learn a little bit about a programming language, you can actually still say something, right? and wide walls where you can say many types of things. So he has all of these ideas about um, how programming languages constrain and shape what can be said. Um, so power and media, I got to high school um, and it shifted again. Um, and the ideas here were sort of informed by my experiences in a classroom. This was the computer lab that was at our school. Um, I'm not in this photo, but that's um, a little bit of what it looked like. There were a whole bunch of old P, uh, 286 PCs, so they were all pretty slow. And there was a, a zero period class, zero period meaning it happened before school, that started at 7 a.m. in the morning. That was how dedicated I was to learning computer science that I was willing to show up that early. And there were eight students in the class um, that had signed up for it. Approximately seven of them were there to play multi-user dungeons and not to learn computer science. Um, I was the one who was kind of interested and engaged. And it was taught by this really strange character. He was a, a community college freshman. So he had just finished high school and was taking computer science classes in the, our local community college. And, and his teaching strategy, um, I hope none of you use this in your classrooms, was he would take the assignments from his class and then give them to us. And then we would try to solve them. And he would take the ones he thought were best and submit them. <laughs> as his solution, and then find out which of us was right, and then give us feedback based on <laughs> 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 He only told me this after he sort of confided in me that he was struggling in his computer science classes. Um, but he was a great mentor. He was actually very supportive and constructive in helping us try to learn, because he was in, engaged in the same kind of learning himself. Right? He was very close to our level of expertise. Um, and at the time, at the, um, because of all of this expression I was trying to do with computing, I also had a lot of friends who were interested in computing as well, but only really as an expressive medium. So we had this club called the Computer Art Club, and none of my friends were interested in computing. They were all interested in music and, and art and, um, and digital media. And so this group of friends kind of defined my interests as well. Right? I was interested in creating things, but also creating things that helped them create things. So I was really interested in 3D rendering at the time, and I'd seen this uh, this screenshot of a game um, in a video game magazine that was trying to make a rendering engine out of ellipses um, instead of polygons to create more organic shapes. Right? It's easier to sort of draw organic stuff with, um, with organic looking shapes when polygons are not particularly organic. Um, and so I, I wanted to try to do this. I wanted to try to replicate this, this 3D engine. And um, you know, I was working on this and my, my computer science teacher walked up and saw me trying to draw ellipses. And, um, I pointed out, and he recognized that they were drawing really, really slowly, um, kind of like with Tetris again. So performance was, was the issue here. And he taught me how to profile my Pascal program. And we found out that um, my program was spending about 95% of its time on square roots. The Pascal standard libraries for doing roots was just particularly slow. Um, so he, his suggestion was, well, go talk to your math teacher. Maybe she knows how to compute roots faster. I don't <laughs> know why she, why she would, and I, and I don't know where that idea came from. but seemed like a reasonable thing at the time. So I went and talked to my teacher. Uh, her name was Miss Hudson. She's there on the bottom. I actually, all of these were my math teachers at some point in high school. But she was really a special one. She had a PhD in math from, from Texas, from Austin. And um, she didn't know anything, any algorithms for computing roots, but she did have a great network. So she wrote back to her former advisor um, at Texas and asked if he knew anything. And he didn't know anything, but he asked somebody. And they eventually found this book, this 1919 book on the history of Greek mathematics that had all kinds of manual algorithms for computing things. Um, and so they did an interlibrary loan thing. The book showed up a few weeks later. And she sort of excitedly gave it to me and said, this is an old book, but they've lent it to you, so take very good care of it. Um, and I opened it up. This is the actual book and found these two pages. These were sort of the, the gold mine that I was looking for. Um, it had square roots, cube roots, nth roots, a whole bunch of manual algorithms for computing things. The weird thing about this, though, and you, you might recognize um, the problem here, there is no standard notation for what any of this is. Right? This is a weird combination of natural language, some of the modern um, uh, notations we use in modern mathematics, but really not using them consistently. So I had to translate all of these ideas in this text into Pascal code, right? I needed to understand the semantics of this notation 
translate him into some semantics that I knew in Pascal in order to optimize my square roots so I could draw my ellipses so that I could, I guess, make games. I never actually did that. Um, so I realized through doing this that programming languages weren't just media and they weren't just power, they were also notations, right? Like music notation. They're a way of trying to encode knowledge so that we can share it and exchange it. Um, and if you take that metaphor of notations, um, there's a lot of implications of that as well, right? They're abstract ways of modeling reality, for example. Um, and yet, there's this question of which parts of reality can't we model with notations, like programming languages? Uh, this stock trading floor, for example, are there parts of this that we can't accurately represent in discrete ways? Um, probably. Do we understand what those limitations are of our notation? Not so much. Right? We don't have a good science of that. Um, if programming languages are notations and notations are about facilitating the exchange of knowledge, well, what kinds of knowledge and information can't programming languages facilitate? It goes back down to the representation of, of knowledge that we encode in binary, essentially, right? What are the limitations of that representation of information? And then there's other implications as well. So if a programming language is a notation, and notations have to be learned, they're these artificial things that we design to capture knowledge. What makes a programming language learnable by somebody? Right? Why don't we have a science yet of what um, learnability is for programming language notations? Um, that's something that we ought to have to understand, for example, how we should be teaching programming languages to the uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students that we teach it to, but we don't have that science yet. That's an open question. So it was sort of inevitable that after these experiences, I went off and, and did computer science in college. I went to Oregon State University. Um, I was also a psychology major as well, because I was really interested in, in people and how they thought about com code and computing, because all of my friends were not interested in code. They were interested in what they could do with it. And so there was a weird duality to my interests that I just needed to pursue, um, sort of approximating a, a degree in HCI. Um, so PL was power, it was media, it was notation. I was coming to college sort of eager to find out what else programming languages might be. And the person who taught that to me first and foremost was my undergraduate mentor, um, Margaret Burnett. She's still faculty at Oregon State. and Does a lot of great research at, at the intersection of HCI and software engineering, kind of like myself. Um, so I met Margaret after seeing a flyer she'd posted in the hallway um, for an undergraduate research position. And um, I think the job I was entertaining after my freshman year was paying like $12 an hour and this job was $11 an hour, and so I kind of weighed, well, it seems a little more interesting, but I'd lose a dollar an hour, is it worth it? I had no idea what research was. So I talked to her, and in half an hour, she not only had me convinced that it was well worth that loss of a dollar an hour, um, but that being a professor was probably the best job in the universe, and that I wanted to have it. So <laughs> that's how good of an undergraduate research mentor she was. She set me on this path, and I fully credit her with showing me the possibilities of, of doing that, so I was sold. So not only did she teach me about research and set me on this path, but she was also my programming languages teacher. So she had a very particular way of, of teaching this. Um, her approach was really a, what I, I like to call a PL parade, right? Um, and she framed it as, as a tour through dozens of programming languages. So we had to take, um, for 10 weeks, the exact same program every week and implement it 12 times across 12 different programming languages. And her goal was to try to teach us the trade-offs in those languages to help us understand um, what the differential benefits and weaknesses are of the design choices in each of those languages, right? Many of these things we talk about very explicitly in communities like this. Um, and so that became a new perspective for me, that programming languages are actually designed things. They are not uh, things that just exist in, in natural settings, it's people like this that have come to design languages, people like you who design them and make these choices and make these trade-offs very explicitly um, to try to understand what their powers are and what their weaknesses are. So this metaphor has a whole bunch of implications as well. Um, designs have trade-offs. That's inherent to any design discipline. It doesn't matter what design domain you're talking about. And so what trade-offs do programming languages make? Which trade-offs, which qualities trade off with each other, right? When you make a programming language more performant, do you lose something else on another dimension? 
Um, and what parts of this design space of, this, of these trade-offs have we not explored, right? In fact, some of the best knowledge about trade-offs that I've found about programming languages is comics like this. <laughs> they really deconstruct in a very principled way exactly what the weaknesses are <laughs> of each language, right? You can go Google these and see all of them. I think they're very informative. Um, if programming languages are designs and designs come from a process, right? Designers follow a process to arrive at a solution. What is a good programming language design process? This is a, um, IDEO, a design studio. Um, this is David Kelly at the D School at Stanford. He teaches a process. They have a particular process they think is good. All the students who come into this studio learn that process. They learn to execute it well. And the result of that is good designs. Um, so what is a good PL design process? When you teach programming languages um, in school and in, in university, what process should you be teaching students that are learning to design languages? Uh, here's another um, idea. If design requires prototyping, and rapid prototyping in particular, what's a good rapid prototyping method for programming languages? Uh, is it enough to sort of jot down a sketch of some syntax, or do you really need to make something that's compilable before you can see the benefits of it? And what does that design space of rapid prototyping techniques for programming languages look like, especially in a world where we consider all of um, these domain-specific languages? Um, and then one last one on the design metaphor. Design is not beauty, it's not aesthetics, but it does leverage aesthetics, right? Um, it uses aesthetics in order to communicate and to simplify and to, and to convey meaning. So what are programming language aesthetics? You know, we toss around ideas like parsimony and simplicity and other types of things, but why don't we have good formal definitions of what all, all of those aesthetics are? Um, seems that we only certain define certain types of principles around programming languages, but none of these other ones that we like to talk in ver about in very subjective ways. So that was college. Um, Margaret did a great job introducing me to HCI and programming languages and software engineering, and I still had this dual passion of psychology and computer science, so the inevitable place for me to go was the HCI Institute at Carnegie Mellon, where all of these were combined together. Um, and that's where I went and, went and did my PhD. And um, a lot of these questions about design and expression and notation and, and power, um, they really sort of shaped what I was looking for in grad school. And, and there were some more people that shaped these ideas as well. So my advisor up on the upper right, Brad Myers, um, he'd been working at the foundations of user interface implementation and user interface technology. So he was really interested in how to use languages to implement um, interfaces. And then I also worked a lot with Randy Pausch, um, the late Randy Pausch, who'd worked on Alice and, and ran this great course on the left called Building Virtual Worlds, where interdisciplinary teams would come together and create interactive experiences. One of the people on that team was writing code in Alice, and then there were musicians and artists and other people working together as well. So Brad encouraged me to go study what was happening in that class, understand how programming languages like Alice are succeeding and failing. And, and so I did. I went and watched people um, try to make things in Alice for a long time in that class for about a semester. And what I found was actually, it was nothing about sort of the semantics of languages that was the problem. What, what was the problem was that people would express what they wanted and then they wouldn't get it quite right and then they would spend hours and hours trying to um, understand the semantics of the language well enough to debug what happened, find some way of patching the program to make it work. Um, so from an HCI lens, the idea here was that students' lack of understanding of that semantics um, led to this inability to um, understand the execution of these programs and, and prevented them from expressing their ideas. Um, this was a fundamental user interface problem, right? Because that's true for any user interface. When you don't understand its model of how it computes, um, you can't take action on it um, to get it to do what you want. And so here, the metaphor was programming languages as interface. Now, this is not only sort of inevitable because um, I was at an HCI institute, right? So of course I was gonna look at it as interface. It was also inevitable though because in the history of computing, programming languages were the first user interface for computers, right? It was the only way you could interact with a computer originally. There were no GUIs, there were no other um, uh, speech-based interfaces like Siri and Alexa. You had to write programs in order to compute things. Um, and so this view of programming languages as interface has a lot of implications as well. If interfaces have to be usable, 
how do we make programming languages usable? Um, we know in HCI that usability is actually dozens and dozens of different facets um, of experience, right? Let's deconstruct all of those different ideas of usability and apply them to programming languages and try to figure out how to make them uh, more accessible and learnable and um, efficient for people to use. Um, one of the things that uh, usable interfaces have to do is give good feedback about what a system did in response to some input. What feedback should programming languages be provi providing? Right? Are, are these good error messages? Are they adequate for helping somebody correct whatever the problem was? Um, I'll talk about a study in just a bit that um, characterizes what a good error message is. If interfaces convey what's possible, in the same way that, like, let's say, a menu in a graphical user interface says, here are the commands that are available. Is Stack Overflow really the best we can do at conveying what you can do with a programming language? A whole bunch of poorly written examples with a bad metadata and lots of disagreement, right? What's a principled way of conveying everything you can create with the language? Um, this is something, again, we don't, haven't really explored. Um, now, you might be wondering, all of these metaphors for programming languages that I've given None of them have talked about that formal, logical, mathematical view yet. And that's actually because I didn't encounter it until I went to a, a software engineering conference for the first time. My first ICSI was in 2006. This was in Shanghai. Um, several of uh, my, my friends and colleagues, and including some of Gail's students, are here in this photo. Um, and th this is where I first encountered programming languages as math. And I have to say it was a little bit of a shock, right? Because I'd never thought of them as that before. It's not the way they were taught in computer science at Oregon State at the time. So this was a new idea to me, that programming languages could just be uh, a logic. And so um, back in 2006, a large proportion of the work at ICSI um, and other software engineering conferences really was um, somewhat formal, like it is here. Um, and so um, all of these were not about expression. They were about propositions, right? They were about uh, verifying propositions. This was the computing culture, sort of the do dominant view that Papert had talked about originally that sort of dominates computer science. It's the one that we're all familiar with here. And all of these um, implications should be obvious to you, right? Math has correctness. Sophiel has correctness, right? That's what we do. Math is about proving things, and so, um, so is computing, right? Uh, we are greatly concerned in mathematics about identity and equivalence. And Therefore, in computing, we are also concerned with identity and equivalence. Um, these are sort of the foundation of a lot of our ideas, and yet it was sort of the last um, representation of programming languages that I encountered in my graduate studies, not the first one. Um, the last place, and where I currently am as faculty at the Information School at the University of Washington, um, was sort of an explosive uh, of encounters around what programming languages are and could be. And it's because it's an exceedingly interdisciplinary place. Uh, we once added up all of the different disciplines of the faculty um, at the information school. And of the 54 faculty that we have, there are 27 different PhD disciplines represented in the school. So that means every conversation I have with a colleague twists and warps my mind in interesting new ways that um, I couldn't have comprehended before that conversation. And that led to a bunch of interesting perspectives on what programming languages are. So I'll give you some examples of what some of these are. Um, this one should be obvious, right? We talk about syntax, semantics, grammars, right? These come from a metaphor of programming languages as natural languages. Um, and there are interesting questions to be asked from this lens, right? Do programming languages have ambiguity? We would like to think they don't, but I guarantee you that if you give any program to somebody that they're unfamiliar with, there's a lot of ambiguity. They have oftentimes no idea what's going on until they've comprehended it for quite some time. Um, how do we shape the, um, uh, how does language shape the way that we computationally think, right? This is the sapir whorf hypo hypothesis that language shapes thought. So how do our programming languages shape our computational thought? Another one is maybe programming languages are communication. We tell computers what to do, right? Telling is a form of communication. So should programming languages model what developers are trying to say and use those models to better dialogue with, programming, uh, with programmers? Um, should programming languages express their intent to developers, right? So that there's better common ground between um, that shared understanding between a developer and a programming language? 
this is an interesting perspective that I got um, in uh, being a CTO uh, that Emerson mentioned I was as part of founding a company and working at it for three years. Um, across all of those years of being a CTO and a developer, um, I, it was hard to think of programming languages as anything other than um, a semantics for function calls um, to stitch together libraries and APIs. In fact, I looked at our code once and that's almost all of the code that was there. We didn't really use conditionals, we didn't use loops, we didn't really do much of anything other than create data structures and do function calls because almost everything was encapsulated in some other library as some abstraction, right? So in that setting, um, it was actually about uh, creating some sort of adhesion between this web service and this library or this data structure and this, this framework over here. So if we start to think about languages in that way, what's a good programming language for stitching together abstractions? Is, is what we have now the best that we can do? Or are there other ways of thinking about um, how to connect services? Um, in my startup life, I also encountered programming languages as legalese for the first time. That's kind of a scary metaphor. Um, in software engineering, programs are often contracts and agreements between what software should and shouldn't do, right? So if programs, our agreements and contracts, that means programming languages are the legalese we use to write those contracts, the promises that we make. Um, so who should interpret these legal contracts um, and who should decide what the semantics of those legal contracts are in embedded in programming languages? Um, and if lawyers write legalese, does that mean that developers and programmers are lawyers? And what kinds of ethical codes must they be bound to if they're writing that type of law? Um, another idea was programming languages as infrastructure. So how many lines of code in the world are, are still COBOL and executing right now to run a lot of the financial institutions in the world? How many people maintain the infrastructure of COBOL? I would hope that it's more than like one person still at IBM or something, right, being paid to do bug fixes and maintain that runtime, right? This is infrastructure that runs all of the information infrastructure in the world. Programming languages are that foundation. So should the public be involved in investing in and maintaining all of the infrastructure of programming languages, right? Who ensures that Python and all of the programs written in it will still exist in 50 years? And how rapidly will that infrastructure decay if we don't invest in it? I'll give you one last perspective from a, um, a recent experience I had this past summer. I was on sabbatical and I decided one of the fun things to do might be to teach some high schoolers computer science just because I hadn't hung out with a lot of high schoolers and I thought that might be an interesting thing to do. So I taught a class of 11 South Seattle high school students, um, fairly low income, all first generation college students, so none of their parents had gone to college before. None of them were interested in computer science. They were only in this class because it was better than signing up for the ballroom dance elective. So um, this is the level of motivation that I started with in the class. And so I spent a lot of time just talking to them about really big picture ideas about what computing is and tying that to really concrete things about learning programming languages. And I asked them at the beginning of the class, what do you think a programming language is? To try to get their perspective of what, um, what they are. And what I found was that um, one of them just sort of blurted out as their first uh, idea was, well, they're just a way out of poverty. Right? That was the concept that they had in their head of what they are. And it's a totally rational perspective, right? If programming languages um, are framed in all of their encounters, in school, in media, all of the students here in Seattle, are sur they're surrounded by software companies, they're surrounded by uh, wealthy Bay Area entrepreneurs moving up to Seattle, right? Every single signal that they're encountering is programming languages as a path to a prosperous middle class, upper middle class life. Um, and in fact, that's probably the most dominant view of what programming languages are in the world. That's the dominant view, not formalism, right? So think about the implications of that. If PL is a path out of poverty and governments create paths out of poverty, should governments create these paths? Um, some of our governments are now, right? Um, this is the CS for All initiative that come out of the, the White House and the idea is to give access to everybody um, to do computing um, in American high schools. And similar things are happening in Great Britain, Australia, and other countries. Um, if PL is a path, um, and paths have to be equitable, how do we make programming languages equitable? 
there are many ways in which the languages we design and implement can't be accessed by large numbers of people. Um, uh, my friend Andy Stefik at, at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, he designed a programming language that was usable by um, blind programmers. And there's about a million blind people just in America, and many more so across the world. Um, surprising number in India, for example, because of the lack of health care. Um, and many of them ought to probably be able to learn how to use programming languages, too. And then finally, there's a scarier question here of, if Peel is a path, and this metaphor of a path means that the paths can only fit so many people on them, who should we, as mentors and teachers and, and other people that know about programming languages, who should we lead down that path? And how do we decide who goes down it? Right now, we kind of don't choose. We sort of let culture determine who's interested in programming languages, and we let our ideas uh, um, that we embrace around math and formalism sort of uh, cause people to self-exclude um, themselves from, from computing, right? So if we were trying to do this more intentionally, you know, what would we do to select in a more principled way who we want to engage in computing, who we want to have this knowledge about programming? So if you zoom way out and you look at all of these ideas, um, to me, over the past 17 years of research, but really over my whole life, uh, since that time I mentioned in, um, in middle school at the age of 12, all of these ideas were valuable. They all shaped my understanding of computing. They all helped to inform my research. But there was something else just sort of as I developed this talk that was really clear to me, and that's that not only were they valuable to me, but they also all are perspectives that embed values implicitly in them, right? A perspective of programming languages as math values certainty in a way. Right. Um, PL is interface, it values efficiency and um, uh, user efficiency. Design is about utility and notation is about sharing and exchange. Um, media is about expression, power is about control. Language is about exchange, communication is about understanding. All of these are values that are embedded in these different perspectives and by focusing on programming languages from one of these perspectives, we focus on that value, right? So if each of these research agendas exposes a different value, then you have to ask, well, what values are the dominant values in um, computer science research and programming languages in particular? Here's my impression, just based on my encounters, right? We care a lot about certainty. That's a big value, and it's a good value to have, right? Because we don't want software to fail in ways that causes harm. Um, but there are a lot of other values here that you might personally value that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about in our research. Um, and so if we look at this space of values, you know, we spend a lot of time on the left and very little time on the right. Um, the stuff on the left is really about computing and the stuff on the right is really about people. You have to ask, how do we investigate some of these ideas on the right that we may not have the right methods for yet? Um, and whether or not we're the right people to do it. Um, so I'm gonna give three examples of how we can start to investigate some of the things further on the right. Just examples from my own research that are approaches to looking at those values um, and those metaphors to show you and try to convince you that, that looking at those um, things on the right are productive and valuable and useful and that you might wanna consider doing some of them yourself. So three examples. We'll start with this metaphor of um, programming languages as communication first. Um, and the value here is developing understanding. People's understanding of computing and also machines' understanding of what people are trying to do with computing. Um, so here the idea is we tell computers what to do. And this led to this research question early on in my dissertation about um, when we tell a computer what to do, it often doesn't do what we intended. And then we wonder, why did it do that, right? So I was asking, how do we interrogate program behavior? How do we understand what happened and have programming languages explain to us um, why they did what they did. That led to this, um, this early work on uh, my dissertation work on the Y line. The idea here was that you could select some program output and say, why did you do that? Um, or select some program output that should have happened and say, why didn't you do that? Um, and then it would generate um, an explanation with a precise backwards dynamic slice to say, well, here's why I did this or here's why I didn't do this. And in some way, having a dialogue with the machine, right, with the programming language. And it was all inherently bound to the semantics of the language, right? Why did you do that? Well, it's because I have all of these operational semantics and I followed these rules and the result was this output that you didn't want. Um, I scaled this up for, for Java several years later. 
both of these had really big impacts on how fast people could localize faults and they can, how fast they could diagnose issues. Um, I had a PhD student that just graduated last year, Brian Berg, who followed up a lot of this work um, in the domain for web interpreters um, with a system called Timelapse and another one called Scry. Um, he found a very similar benefits of, of sort of framing interaction with the programming language as a dialogue, right? Interrogating behavior and trying to get explanations back. Um, Brian actually graduated and went off to Apple and they hired him to upstream a lot of these ideas because when Apple looked at these ideas, they said, those are values we care about and that our, that our users care about. They want to understand what machines are doing. We want to help them get that understanding. So we want to invest in embedding those values in WebKit um, and, and Safari in particular. And so now, really, it goes back to that value, right? We started with that, that value and it led to um, real concrete impact in WebKit to express and embody that value in the tools and capabilities inside of that framework. Okay, example number two, um, notation, programming languages as notation, which is about exchange, right, sharing knowledge. I started with this question of how do we make programs readable, right? You can't exchange knowledge if you can't read a notation. So let's think about how to make programming languages readable. Uh, one example was a system called Barista that I did where I was trying to render code in, in rich text ways that made it more comprehensible. So instead of having a big expression using the syntax of the language, why not just use mathematical notation to render things when you're in reading mode? Um, another system uh, was um, called Jasper. And the idea here was um, a lot of this great work that Dale had done on cross-cutting concerns, trying to think about how to visualize concerns that cross-cut across an architecture, right? By bringing together all of the disparate parts of a concern into one place so that you could view them all in one place. Um, and then more recent work, we've looked at um, how to not make programs more readable, but how to teach people how to read a, a notation. So essentially teach them a programming language and its semantics. And what we've done is taken all of the operational semantics of a programming language and automatically generate a tutor that teaches those semantics very rapidly. Um, so in this unpublished work, we can now teach a programming language and its semantics in about three to five hours to somebody who's never seen a line of code before and give them a program and they can reliably predict its output with just those three hours of practice for its semantics. So a lot of these ideas have made it into a lot of different um, products and a lot of different tools. Um, a lot of these principles around how to render code and make it more comprehensible. Um, all of them go back down to this value of exchange, right? If you can understand a notation, you can understand what it means, you can share and distribute knowledge around um, what those notations mean. Last example is on power, going back to that first idea that I had um, of programming languages. Power is about control and agency, right? The feeling that you can make a computer do what you want. Um, this was work that was led by my PhD student, Mike Lee, who's now faculty um, at New Jersey Institute of Technology. And he started with this really provocative question of what effect does the power relationship between a novice and a compiler have on learning? power relationship. So what he observed was that actually compiler errors like this, what kind of relationship do they frame between a learner and a compiler? They, they, it, what it does is it says the compiler is this all-knowing, um, omnipotent authority that constantly tells you through a stream of messages, you are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong, your statement was invalid, your syntax is invalid, you're failing, you're failing, you're failing, until finally you succeed if you make it that far, right? Um, and he found, found that kind of relationship problematic and thought about, well, what other kinds of relationships could we frame? And so his idea uh, was embodied in this game that he designed called Gidget. And here, he wanted to frame a compiler as a reliable but unintelligent collaborator. It'll do exactly what you tell it to, but it has no intelligence. And you, as the developer, have to have the creative problem-solving ability to make sure it, that the, it, the computer does what you want. That should sound familiar to you, because that's exactly what programming is, right? Computers are really, really dumb, and, and all the intelligence they have are something that we give to them, right? So that's what he was trying to teach. And it had all of these really great impacts. There was a very long series of studies that showed that really subtle design choices about the messages, uh, the way that error messages were framed, the way that data was presented in this environment, the way that assessments were done, that um, a lot of these had these really big effects of not only making people um, learn twice as fast because they were paying attention to the right things and listening to the compiler and what it was saying, um, but they actually engaged voluntarily for twice as long when we allowed them to quit at any time.
So faster learning, longer engagement, just by changing the relationship of the power dynamics between the two. Uh, he launched this game um, last year. About 10,000 people have played it without any marketing, ages 8 to 80. Um, and the really exciting thing is that all of those design principles that we discovered that led to that better learning and better engagement, um, uh, the non-policy um, group Code.org in the United States picked up those design principles, built them into their learning technologies, and now those have reached 10 million learners um, in the United States through all of the K through 12 curriculum that they've been deploying across the United States for the past couple of years. And all of that has led to control. Right? Those 10 million learners now feel like they have some power, just like the power that I felt over computers and, and um, what they're doing. So work like that can change this distribution of what we know and, and what values we're exploring. Right? Um, and it's also changing the values that, uh, of the work that we disseminate into the world. Right? And showing people that computing can be something a little broader than, than just math. Um, and all of that's in turn changing the values in our research community because the people that see all of that work that gets disseminated into the world, that changes their ideas about what computing is. That brings them to us in computer science departments with new ideas about what computing is. And then they look for those values inside of our departments, right? But it does beg a couple of important questions. One is what should the distribution of that knowledge be? Maybe it's right that everything is mostly focused on certainty and there's just a little bit of work on these other values. Maybe it's not right. That's a conversation that we should have. Um, who should be doing this research? Are all of these things computer science research? Probably not, right? Some of them might be policy or economics or other things, but maybe a subset of these actually are things that ought to be programming language research or at least computer science research. Um, and then there's this big question of, will the research happen on all of these things if we don't embrace the, all of these values? If we explicitly reject all of these perspectives, it's probably not going to be the case that other disciplines pick up these questions because these are our questions, right? These are our questions about the phenomena we care about in computing. So here's a couple of things I think. Um, I think that as a discipline, CS doesn't have to explore all of these, um, these views, um, but it should explicitly encourage the exploration of a, a lot of these. Um, maybe in direct collaboration with other disciplines, right? Um, in ways, for example, that we look at um, algorithmic bias right now. Some computer scientists are working with an ethicist and trying to understand the intersections between those two computationally, but also ethically. Um, and that we really do, if, if um, we don't do the work ourselves, have to embrace all of these values. Because if we don't, we're going to explicitly include all of the people that come with those values to our communities. We need to have that broader perspective. So how do we operationalize some of these things? Um, I'm going to give a few very concrete recommendations for you to think about. One is that when you're choosing a new research question, the next project that you decide to work on, just consider one of these alternative views of programming languages. Um, maybe there's one that's close but not identical to what you're currently doing, where you might have the skills to pursue it, or maybe you have a collaborator who could help you pursue it. Try considering um, uh, one of those questions and flattening out a bit of that distribution by looking at this space of, of research that we don't usually consider. Um, and then to close the loop on this, when you're writing your paper, try to be explicit about what that view of programming languages is. Are you looking at programming languages as interface? Say that. If you're really thinking about it as, as um, logical formalisms, maybe, maybe say that too. The more explicit we can be about that, the more room and space there will be for those other perspectives to thrive. Now when you submit your paper and you get a pile of them to review, um, remember to evaluate a paper against what its view of programming language is, is not your view. Right? Uh, the number of papers I, uh, reviews I get back that say, well, this, I'm sure this is great and all, but it's not science, and so I can't publish it um, at this venue, right? Uh, accept that there are these alternative views of what programming languages are, and try to evaluate them for what the intent was, right? Not against your, your own favorite perspective. And then finally, to in really ensure all of that, um, when you're teaching programming languages, uh, Try to explain multiple views of what they are. Uh, I think Sriram Krishnamurthy does a great job of this in a lot of his classes. He's very pluralistic about what he thinks programming languages are. And this is despite the fact that um, he's an absolute functional language fanatic, right? 
he will tell you what all of those other perspectives are and why those are also valid arguments and why he rejects them, but also why they're valid, <laughs> right? So there are ways of being pluralistic even if you have strong opinions and strong beliefs about what programming languages are. And I think if you do some of those things, even those really basic things, um, will not only start to approach that inclusive computing culture that Papper talked about and kind of dreamt of, but we'll also start to create a more inclusive world in general in which all of these perspectives and all of the values that get tied to them are more reflected in our work and also in society in general. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think I've had a lot of um, great conversations with some of you this week about some of those issues around expertise. So, so one of the ideas is that we invent all of these really powerful ideas um, and even powerful new programming language designs or techniques that embedded, get embedded into programming languages. There's a really open question around how do you effectively teach the proper use of those um, abstractions to experts? Right? It doesn't matter that you know a whole bunch of programming languages. If you've invented some new thing they don't know, and you want them to use it and harness it in an effective way, usually there's a right way to use it and a wrong way to use it. Right? Um, if you gave somebody no training on how to write any formal specifications and you just said, here's a tool, they are probably not going to do it in a, an effective and, and um, highly leveraged way. So there's, there's a question there, even at the level of expertise, of how you teach experts to properly use an abstraction that we've invented. Um, so that's that's one perspective on it. Um, I think that, in general, um, the reason why a lot of research is focused on novices is because uh, that's a particularly hard problem, right? Um, we don't succeed at it when we measure learning of um, people's understanding of computing after an intro programming class. For the most part, they've learned very little after that class, um, and, that's, and that's an acute problem. It's not as problematic that an expert isn't learning as efficiently as they might otherwise, because they usually can learn um, successfully. Yeah, yeah, I do. I'll try to keep them brief because that's a big topic. Um, you could have, I could have written a whole talk that talked about programming instead of programming languages, and it would have had slightly different implications, right? Um, in fact, uh, at the Plateau workshop on Tuesday, one of the exercises we did at the end of the day was to try to look at metaphors of programming and try to understand what implications some of those metaphors had um, for, um, for the study of programming as an activity that occurs, right? And I think that was just as potent and powerful as some of these ideas around programming languages. Um, and yet programming is a much broader scope than, than just the language itself, because it's not just about all of the other tools and systems that are involved in those things, but it's actually all about the human activities that surround 
um, what happens when somebody's programming. Because usually, if they're not doing it alone, usually there's some larger extrinsic motive for doing it. Maybe you're doing it in the part of a uh, company. If you're doing it for yourself, that actually changes things quite a bit. I've done a lot of research on end user programming where people are writing programs to accelerate their own work um, for some other external goal. Right? That's a very different activity than doing it um, in the context of a team to sell as a service or a product. So there's a very rich space there um, that, that is very underexplored. And this is just a small, tiny piece of that space. Right? So I think there's a, ma a vast potential for investigation. Yeah, well, well, I mean, I, I can say we already do, right? There's a few epistemologies here. Um, to an extent, this community accepts um, um, empiricism as occasionally, sometimes, if we must, a valid form of knowledge, <laughs> right? Um, that, that's at least two. And I think software engineering um, has actually made a lot of progress over, over the past couple of years. It's even in, accepted a third, and, and there's a lot more qualitative that work that happens in software engineering as well. So that's a community that's got three epistemologies in it. Um, other uh, broader fields, I think the um, HCI community in computing probably is up to like seven or eight epistemologies now. It hasn't fallen apart yet. Um, it is hard to bridge some of that knowledge when you have a very different stance on what constitutes valid knowledge. But the hard work of doing that bridging is actually very productive sometimes because in some sense it's a form of triangulation. right? Because one epistemology is one stance on what constitutes valid knowledge and you take another stance that conflicts with it and has tension with it, and you try to find the synthesis between the two, and you actually usually find a greater truth. Um, it's very common now in lots of other areas of academia to do um, mixed method, mixed epistemology papers that say, well, let's take this stance for half the paper and this stance for half the paper and really figure out where, um, where the ground truth is between those two. Um, so yes, I think it's possible. It is hard. It is scary. It means you probably spend 10 or 15 years as a community trying to just skill up on an epistemology so you can even properly review the work, or at least um, inviting people onto program committees that already have that skill so that you can do that properly. But I actually think it's very useful and productive. Yeah, um, for the most part, I only have questions. I don't have a lot of answers. And you can see that a lot of my work over the past uh, 15 years is really focused on sort of the interface metaphor, um, the communication metaphor, not so much the language metaphor. I think there are really interesting things, though, that people have done recently to look at that. Um, so, so Prem Devenbu in software engineering has looked at um, programming languages as natural languages um, very recently. And, and one of the things we know about natural languages is that there's actually a lot of statistical regularity in the way that language is used, despite the vast infinite space of language you can express, right? So he leveraged that and looked to see whether or not that same regularity occurred in how people write programs with na uh, programming languages, found that same regularity, and actually was able to leverage that to um, identify uh, defects. Um, because there's regularity in the way that defects occur because of that regularity in, in use. So you know, it's another great example of somebody just taking a slightly different perspective on what PL is and what programs are and finding a very productive series of discoveries out of that. And I hope that he'll continue that work and other people will to really expand that space of that metaphor um, along with all of the others that we could pursue. I like those 
important on some of that, for instance, communication. Many people think of programming as like, I write a huge book, and if I have a question on that book, like, why is it failing? Or if some guy wrote it 10 years ago, I forgot to read that book. But if I'm asking you a question, you're not giving me a book and then say, okay, digest it. Or things like, like language. Language is always an exchange of ideas normally, and not just this big blur. Or um, usually, if you if you think of, of interfaces there for, for some purpose, and if I look at it from some other purpose, I might need an adapter. But I think this view is, is sometimes sometimes lost because people say, oh, "Look, why is it to move to a large document?" And, and that's kind of the communication and the exchange that's going on. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and in, in a way these metaphors are thinking tools as well, right? My proposal really is that you use these as tools to identify new re research questions and to think about the um, contributions that you've made from a different perspective. And I think it can be a productive way of identifying opportunities for really um, improving along many dimensions how we engage with programming. for the waffles. And a plaque. Thanks. Respect Andy and